Hello to chapter 12 of From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne in a translation uh, by Louis Mercier and Eleanor E. King. And this chapter is titled Urbi et Orbi. The astronomical, mechanical and topographical difficulties resolved finally came the question of finance. The sum required was far too great for any individual or even any single state to provide the requisite millions. President Barbicane undertook, despite the matter being a purely American affair, to render it one of universal interest and so request the financial cooperation of all peoples. It was, he maintained, the right and duty of the whole Earth to interfere in the affairs of its satellite. The subscription opened at Baltimore extended properly to the whole world, urbi et orbi. This subscription was successful beyond all expectation, notwithstanding that it was a question not of lending, but of giving the money. It was a purely disinterested operation in the strictest sense of the term and offered not the slightest chance of profit. The effect, however, of Barbicane's communication was not confined to the frontiers of the United States. It crossed the Atlantic and Pacific, invading simultaneously Asia and Europe, Africa and Oceanica. The observatories of the Union placed themselves in immediate communication with those of foreign countries, some such as those of Paris, Petersburg, Berlin, Stockholm, Hamburg, Malta, Lisbon, Benares, Madras and others transmitted their good wishes. The rest maintained a prudent silence quietly awaiting the result. As for the observatory at Greenwich, seconded as it was by the 22 astronomical establishments of Great Britain, it spoke plainly enough. It boldly denied the possibility of success and pronounced in favor of the theories of Captain Nicholl. But this was nothing more than mere English jealousy. On the 8th of October, President Barbicane published a manifesto full of enthusiasm, in which he made an appeal to all persons of goodwill upon the face of the earth. This document, translated into all languages, met with immense success. Subscription lists were opened in all the principal cities of the Union, with a central office at the Baltimore Bank 9 Baltimore Street. In addition, subscriptions were received at the following banks in the different states of the two continents. At Vienna, with S. M. the Rothschild. At Petersburg, Stieglitz and Company. At Paris, the Credit Mobilier. At Stockholm, Totti and Arfuridsen. At London, N. M. Rothschild and Son. At Turin, Ardouin and Company. At Berlin, Mendelssohn. At Geneva, Lombard, Odier and Company. At Constantinople, the Ottoman Bank. At Brussels, J. Lambert. At Madrid, Daniel Weisweller. At Amsterdam, Netherlands Credit Company. At Rome, Torlonia and Company. At Lisbon, Le Quenze. At Copenhagen. Hagen Private Bank, at Rio de Janeiro Private Bank, at Montevideo Private Bank, at Valparaiso and Lima, Thomas La Chambre and Company, at Mexico Martin Darren and Company. Three days after the manifesto of President Barbicane, four million dollars were paid into the different towns of the Union. With such a balance, the gun club might begin operations at once, but some days later advices were received to the effect that foreign subscriptions were being eagerly taken up. Certain countries distinguished themselves by their liberality, others untied their purse strings with less facility. 
a matter of temperament. Figures are, however, more eloquent than words, and here is the official statement of the sums which were paid to the credit of the gun club at the close of the subscription. Russia paid in as her contingent the enormous sum of 368,733 rubles. No one need be surprised at this. Who bears in mind the scientific taste of the Russians and the impetus which they have given to astronomical studies thanks to their numerous observatories? France began by deriding the pretensions of the Americans. The moon served as a pretext for a thousand stale puns and a score of ballads in which bad taste contested the palm with ignorance. But as formerly the French paid before singing, so now they paid after having had their laugh, and they subscribed for a sum of 1,253,930 francs. At that price they had a right to enjoy themselves a little. Austria showed herself generous in the midst of her financial crisis. Her public contributions amounted to the sum of 216,000 florins, a perfect godsend. 52,000 rix dollars were the remittance of Sweden and Norway. The amount is large for the country, but it would undoubtedly have been considerably increased had the subscription been opened in Christiana simultaneously with that at Stockholm. For some reason or other, the Norwegians do not like to send their money to Sweden. Prussia, by a remittance of 250,000 thalers, testified her high appro approval of the enterprise. Turkey behaved generously, but she had a personal interest in the matter. The moon, in fact, regulates the cycle of her years and her fast of Ramadan. She could not do less than give 1,370,640 piastres, and she gave them with an eagerness which denoted, however, some pressure on the part of the government. Belgium distinguished herself among the second-rate states by a grant of 513,000 francs, about two centimes per head of her population. Holland and her colonies interested themselves to the extent of 110,000 florins, only demanding an allowance of 5%, discount for paying ready money. Denmark, a little contracted in territory, gave nevertheless 9,000 ducats, providing her love for scientific experiments. The Germanic Confederation pledged itself to 34,285 florins. It was impossible to ask for more, besides they would not have given it. Though very much crippled, Italy found 200,000 lire in the pocket of her people. If she had had Venetia, she would have done better, but she had not. The states of the church thought that they could not send less than 7,040 Roman crowns, and Portugal carried her devotion to science as far as 30,000 cruzados. It was the widow's might. 86 piastres, but self-constituted empires are always rather short of money. 257 France this week, no, sorry, 257 francs. This was the modest contribution of Switzerland to the American work. One must freely admit that she did not see the practical side of the matter. It did not seem to her that the mere dispatch of a shot to the moon could possibly establish any relation of affairs with her, and it did not seem prudent to her to embark her capital in so hazardous an enterprise. After all, perhaps she was right. As to Spain, she could not scrape together more than 110 reals. She gave as an excuse that she had her railways to finish. 
the truth is that science is not favorably regarded in that country, it is still in a backward state and moreover certain Spaniards, not by any means the least educated, did not form a correct estimate of the bulk of the projectile compared with that of the moon. They feared that it would disturb the established order of things. In that case, it were better to keep aloof, which they did to the tune of some reals. There remained but England, and we know the contemptuous antipathy which, with which she received Barbicane's proposition. The English have but one soul for the whole 26 millions of inhabitants which Great Britain contains. They hinted that the enterprise of the gun club was contrary to the principle of non-intervention, and they did not subscribe a single farthing. At this intimation, the gun club merely shrugged its shoulders and returned to its great work. When South America, that is to say Peru, Chile, Brazil, the provinces of La Plata and Colombia had poured forth their quota into their hands, the sum of $300,000, it found itself in possession of a considerable capital of which the following is a statement. United States subscriptions, $4 million foreign subscriptions, 100, no, one, 100 no, I'm sorry, I'm really bad with numbers. $1,464,675. Total, $5,446,675. Such was the sum which the public poured into the treasury of the gun club. Let no one be surprised at the vastness of the amount the work of casting, boring, masonry, the transport of workmen, their establishment in an almost uninhabited country, the construction of furnaces and workshops, the plant, the powder, the projectile, and incipient expenses would, according to the estimates, absorb nearly the whole. Certain cannon shots in the Federal War cost $1,000 apiece. This one of President Barbicane, unique in the annals of gunnery, might well cost 5,000 times more. On the 20th of October, a contract, contract was entered into with the manufactory at Cold Spring near New York, which during the war had furnished the largest parrot, cast iron guns. It was stipulated between the contracting parties that the manufactory of Cold Spring should engage to transport to Tampa Town in southern Florida the necessary material for casting the Columbiad. The work was bound to be completed at latest by the 15th of October following and the cannon delivered in good condition under penalty of a forfeit of $100 a day to the moment when the moon should again pres present, present herself under the same conditions, that is to say, in 18 years and 11 days. The engagement of the workmen their pay and all the necessary details of, their, of the work developed upon the Cold Spring Company. This contract, executed in duplicate, was signed by Barbicane, president of the gun club of the one part and T. Murchison, director of the Cold Spring Manufactory of the other, who thus executed the deed on behalf of their respective principals. God, so many numbers. <laughs> so yeah, that was that one's for today. That was chapter twelve. Bye bye. Till next time, with chapter thirteen titled Stone Hill. <laughs>